Welcome to CSC 240, Introduction to Different Programming Languages. My name is Wade Huber, and I'm the instructor for this course. In these first few videos, we're going to talk about programming languages in general, programming paradigms, and why CSE 240 is a course that you're required to take. So we'll start off with a joke. What happens if you have a problem and ask a computer scientist to write a program to solve it? And the answer is that the computer scientist will come back a year later presenting you with a brand new programming language ideally suited for solving your problem. And that's funny because it's true. John von Neumann asked the question, why would you want more than machine language? And I think you know the answer to that, but that's something that we'll actually talk about today. And another quote I think that's relevant to programming languages is from Paul Graham, who said, programming languages are not just technology, but what programmers think in. They're half technology and half religion. And there's a lot of truth to that statement because once you get your head wrapped around a programming language, that tends to be the way you address any type of problem that you're faced with. And the more programming languages you know, the more options you have for choosing a language that's best suited for what you're trying to accomplish. And there's also this quote from Barnes Strawstrip who developed C++. There's only two kinds of languages, the ones people complain about and the ones nobody uses. And if you spend any time looking around about programming languages online, you'll see that that's true. So you're probably aware at this point that there's thousands of programming languages that are currently in use today. And there's no way for you to learn all of them. But the good news is, is that for all the programming languages there are, there's really just a few underlying paradigms that unite many languages. So if you know one of those paradigms, then you can usually pick up another language that uses that same paradigm pretty rapidly. So an example would there would be if you know C++, Java, or C Sharp, then you can pick up the other languages much more quickly than if you're coming to, at those languages from scratch. And one of the things that you'll see with, with languages is sometimes the language's paradigm may have more long-term value than the language itself. So anytime a language introduces a, a really clever new feature or a new paradigm, a lot of times that gets taken and applied to existing languages, even if that original language never goes anywhere. So we've used this term language paradigm. So what does that mean? Well, when we talk about a language paradigm, we're talking about the basic principles of how a computation or algorithm is expressed. In this course, we're going to talk about four different paradigms. There are more, but these are the four that are the most common. So the first is the imperative or procedural paradigm, where you have some data and your program manipulates that data step by step. So Pascal, Fortran, Ada, and C would all be examples of those, C being the one that we'll look at in this class. The next paradigm that we'll look at is object-oriented, and that's something that you should have some experience from with Java. The idea behind object-oriented programming is that you have state that's encapsulated in objects and that these objects can be modified or manipulated through methods or messages. So you'll see things like abstract data types, encapsulation, inheritance, dynamic binding. Those are all important features of object-oriented programming, and we'll talk about those this semester. And it's important to keep in mind, though, that these ideas aren't necessarily tied just to object-oriented programming. It's possible to do inheritance in C and certainly it's impossible to do things like encapsulation in C. It's just that with an object-oriented language, you're going to get more language support for doing those things. So some examples of object-oriented programming languages, you've seen Java, C Sharp, Smalltalk, C++, those are all object-oriented programming languages. The third paradigm that we're going to see in this course is the functional or applicative paradigm, and those have a higher level of abstraction. A lot of the ideas used in functional programming have direct analogs in math. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be doing a lot of calculus in this course, but certainly those of you who have a more sophisticated mathematical background, you're going to find functional programming a lot more straightforward than some of you who have a more strictly object-oriented background. And the reason for that is with functional languages and also, as we'll see with logic languages, the idea of what you're trying to do with your program is different. And so there's this higher level of abstraction. You're stepping further away from the actual mechanics of the computer, and that allows you to think more like a person would think it's more natural assuming you've never done programming before, which of course, all of you should have done programming before. So you'll have a little bit of struggle at the beginning. Although in general, this tends to be everybody's favorite paradigm we study. Some features of that paradigm are that there's no side effects. There's no state like you would have in an object. They lend themselves toward a modular design and your programs consist of the composition of functions. Again, if you don't understand what those are, we'll cover them later in the semester. But again, just like we had with object-oriented programming, some of these things are features that you can have in any language. So it's possible to write object-oriented code where there's state, but that state never changes. Or you can write C code that doesn't exhibit side effects. So again, the idea is learn these paradigms 
and then take away concepts from each and apply them to your language of choice. Some example functional languages are Lisp or Scheme, ML, Scala, and Clojure. And functional features have been cropping up in a lot of languages. So languages like Python, Java, and C Sharp have a lot of functional capabilities now. And then the last paradigm that we're going to talk about in this course is the declarative paradigm. The declarative paradigm is a step away from programming completely. You're more focused on what your goal is, not how to get to your goal. You let the computer figure out how to get to your goal. You tell it what you want, give it some information about the world. It will deduce from those statements whether or not it's able to achieve your goal. So you'll see the declarative paradigm used with database languages a lot. In fact, there's a database language based on Prolog, which is the language that we'll cover in this course. Now, in practice, programs can use a mix of paradigms. In some cases, one paradigm is clearly superior, but in general, no one paradigm is always the best. So it's up to you to determine what language or what paradigm is best suited for the problem that I'm faced with. So by learning different paradigms, which is what you'll do in this course, it enhances your ability to choose the best language for your needs. And again, this will not always be the same language. So you don't want to be a devotee of a particular language. You want to always have several languages in your toolbox. So why is CSE 240 a required course? So the first is if you learn paradigms, that helps you learn new languages or new features in existing languages. So even if you never use any of the languages that we cover, for a large part of you, you might not ever use a language we cover in this course, but at the very least, it exposes you to different ways of approaching problems so that your mind is not locked into one way of doing things. So learning new languages makes you a more well-rounded programmer. Again, you're not focused on just one way of doing things, you have multiple tools in your toolbox. Now the languages that have been chosen for CSE 240 allow us to focus on the paradigm instead of the language itself. So this is not a C course, it's not a C++ course, it's not a scheme course, it's not a prologue course, it's a paradigm course. So we're not necessarily going to look at the entire language. So for example, scheme allows lots of non-functional aspects, but none of those will be allowed in this course because again, we're trying to learn functional programming when we learn scheme. And so we're going to be focused on the functional components of Scheme itself. Now, the one exception, most of you know object-oriented programming pretty well now. So with C++, we'll touch on object-oriented programming. We'll talk about how it does polymorphism and so forth. But we'll also spend quite a bit of time talking about memory allocation and how memory is allocated and how a program works with memory. And again, that's just something that's good to know, even if you never actually need to use it in the future. Having that as something that's in the back of your mind while you're designing programs is going to help you design better programs. So one way to think of this course is this is more of a career skills course versus a job skills course. We're not trying to teach you how to do something that you can take directly and apply it to a job. Instead, we're talking about something to help you become a more well-rounded programmer, something to make you a better programmer, a more flexible programmer, so that as you move forward in your career, you're able to pick up new skills much more quickly. And you're able to make better decisions about what technologies, what languages to use. Now, one objection I hear a lot of times when it comes to what we're talking about in this class what we talk about in this one objection I hear a lot when it comes to what we talk about in this course is why are we learning all these old languages? So I think the newest language we cover is C++, which came on the scene basically around 1980. So over 40 years is the baby of these courses. So if you look at C, that goes into the 70s and Prolog, you can make the case that it goes back to the 1920s if you really get into the history of, of the logic behind how it works. Uh, but if you've used this website before, which I'm sure most of you have, hopefully enough to find answers to your solutions, but I'm sure you've used it for other reasons. The paper that talked about the technology that Google is based on has these references. And you'll notice these references go way back in the past. And many of these were before we actually had computers. And the thing I want you to take away from this is that you can learn a specific technology and that'll get you up to some point. But if you understand fundamentals, that can get you much further. So a lot of computer science is based on fundamentals that have been around for a long time that are incorporated into these older languages that we'll be talking about. So don't get too hung up on the age of the program, the programming languages we talk about. Keep in mind that if you focus on the principles, those are going to last forever because those principles aren't a specific technology. They're applicable to anything. So one last quote I want to leave you with is from Brett Victor, who had a talk called The Future of Programming, where he pretends he's a programmer, I think around the 1972 timeframe, where he talks about the future of programming and some of the things that are going on at that point. And of course, the joke is that we really haven't moved forward in a lot of ways from that point. But one of the points he makes is nobody knew what programming was, so they were able to try anything. The most dangerous thought that you can have as a creative person is to think you know what you're doing 
because then you stop looking around for other ways of doing things and you stop being able to see other ways to do things. So hopefully this course helps you break out of a single way of thinking about things and gives you the creativity so that you can start looking at other ways of doing things to accomplish whatever task you have in front of you. So that's why CSE 240 exists. That's why that it's a required course. Keep that in mind. Keep in mind that you're focused on the, the principles, not necessarily the specific technologies. And in the future videos, we'll talk about the history of programming languages and also some characteristics that all languages share.